I'd like to uh, begin uh, by thanking uh, d the doctor, thank you very much, and by acknowledging that we're on unceded Algonquin territory. Uh, my name is Jesse Thistle. I am a Métis Cree from northern Saskatchewan. Uh, Eleven years ago, I was that homeless uh, addict dealing with some serious mental health challenges. I was addicted to crack cocaine and paid regular visits to correctional facilities across Ontario. I couldn't read or write at a literate level. I had no high school education and I couldn't walk on my own, consequent of a serious injury and a staph infection that almost took my leg and my life. I was that limping homeless person that many in society would avoid if they saw me approach on the street looking for change or help or just some conversation. Today, however, I can read and write and walk just fine. In fact, I'm a Trudeau Vanier scholar, a Governor General medalist, and the resident scholar of Indigenous homelessness at the Canadian Observatory on Homelessness. And I'm one of the most decorated PhD students in the country. So how did that happen, you ask? How did I make the giant leap from there to here? Well, in a nutshell, I used the jail system, rehab, and school as pathways off the streets. I used them as a way to reconnect myself back into the interconnected web of all my relations. Jail saved my life and allowed me to keep my leg. Rehab got me sober and gave me back my heart. And education helped me figure out why I was out of control and why my Indigenous family was so broken. School also showed me why my dad was murdered in 1982, why my parents abandoned me and my brothers in 1980, and why my grandparents, Searle and Jackie Thistle, were the only real love I'd known until I met my wife in 2009. That deep understanding helped me forgive some of the past. But admittedly, I'm still working on it. You see, I'm not only a survivor of Canadian street life, I'm a survivor of Canadian colonization. And my decade on and off the streets was a result of intergenerational trauma, a, for, uh, a form of PTSD that is passed down through the generations, which destroyed my nuclear family by the time I was three years old. The destruction of my family made me resentful growing up, which negatively impacted my choices and eventually led to my addictions and homelessness. In adulthood, intergenerational trauma, for those who don't know, expresses itself in things like addictions, sexual and physical abuse, misogyny, mental health challenges, criminality, transience, and homelessness, which appear more frequently in Indigenous families than in the general population of Canada. My family was no exception. In this regard, I am not unique as thousands upon thousands of indigenous homeless people across the country are just like me, resistors of colonial trauma, whose homes have been devastated by land displacements, projects of forced assimilation, linguicide, domicide, genocide, residential schools, structural violence, racism, marginalization, and a general ignorance from settlers towards indigenous realities. Essentially, the making of this country has made whole communities of indigenous people homeless. And that is what we're seeing in our shelter systems and streets today. But before I get into that, perhaps I should let you know who I am so you know where I'm coming from. My mother is Blanche Morissette from Big River, Saskatchewan. Her people are the rebel Métis Cree who fought against Canada during the 1885 Northwest Resistance. Canada crushed our freedom fight by sending an army of thousands of well-armed soldiers and Northwest Mounted Police to fight against hundreds of ill-equipped Métis families, grandmothers and grandfathers, sisters and brothers, wives and husbands and sons and daughters who died at Batash, defending our homes and our livelihoods. After the resistance, the government stole our lands, denied us any rights, and banished us to absolute poverty for over a century. Traumatized, we came to squat on crown land on the sides of the roads and the railways, 
Thus, we became known as the Road Allowance Michif. We couldn't borrow money, we couldn't practice co-op agriculture, we couldn't participate in the free market, we couldn't get jobs, and we didn't even have any treaty support or formal education of any kind. This was our punishment for challenging Canadian imperial designs and for Prime Minister Sir John A. Macdonald's personal grudge against Riel for embarrassing him during the 1869 Red River resistance for which John A. was prematurely forced to create the province of Manitoba as a Métis homeland. Macdonald never kept his promise to us Métis though and instead gave away our land to settlers the minute the ink was dry. My mother's people have been essentially homeless ever since. My father, on the other hand, was Sonny Searle Thistle. His people are the Algonquin of Northern Ontario and the Highland Scots of Cape Breton Island, Nova Scotia. My father's maternal grandfather was Algonquin David Mackenzie, born in Notre Dame de Nord, Quebec. Grandpa David was stolen from his people at age seven and incarcerated at Indian Residential School in Spanish Ontario in 1915. At Spanish, he suffered sexual, physical, and emotional abuse, which would torment him his whole life. David's daughter, my grandmother Jackie, had it rough living under his roof. And as a result, she didn't learn good parenting skills from her father or what it meant to be Algonquin. Algonquin to Grandma Jackie meant the pain and neglect of her damaged father, something she learned to run from by the 1950s. Grandpa Searle Thistle, my father's father, was a Cape Bretoner. His ancestors were the Gaelic Scots who were displaced from their highland homes to make room for industrial sheep herding. This violent period in 19th century British imperial history is called the Highland Clearances. The English overlords simply rounded up the Scottish Gales stuck them on boats, and then shipped them off to Cape Britain, and then forgot about them. Canada continued this tradition. Many starved to death in the new environment. As such, Grandpa Searle's line suffered a severe economic neglect over 150 years, a, ne a neglect that eventually killed my great-grandfather Samuel, who was worked to death in the Sydney coal mines in 1938. Thus, Grandpa Th uh, Thistle grew up without his father, and he too wasn't equipped to raise children, just like Grandma Jackie. When my grandparents married and had my dad in the early 1950s, the odds were stacked against them. The transgenerational trauma they'd both inherited from their ancestors combined to alienate my teenage father by the late 1960s, which in turn led to his experimentation with drugs, then hardcore addictions, high-risk lifestyle, and eventual murder in 1982. But I didn't know any of this history growing up, or what intergenerational trauma was. All I knew was that my mom and my dad weren't around, and that my grandparents in Toronto had to adopt me and my two brothers after dad robbed some stores and disappeared after skipping parole in 1982. The last known sighting of my dad was outside my Aunt Sherry's place, in December of that year. He got into a car with some people, drove off, and then vanished into thin air. My dad was an outlaw, and the police now believe he most likely met the fate of someone who lived that kind of lifestyle. To explain my dad's disappearance, my grandparents always told us that he'd lost his mind on drugs and was homeless somewhere. But the truth was that they didn't know what happened to him or where he was. No one did. I remember seeing, a, seeing as a kid unopened presents addressed to my dad linger under a Christmas tree until about mid-February. After the tree came down, my grandma put his presents away with the previous year's presents, just in case he came home. Each year, the pile in the closet grew until one year, she just stopped. Giving up hope must have been hard on my grandmother. And my mom, we never knew why she left my dad or why she wasn't around. To us, she was a great mystery, far away, sending letters periodically, calling every few years, and visiting twice over the course of two decades. From the pictures I had of her, 
I knew she was native. Long black hair, beautiful brown skin, and deep charcoal eyes. She once tried explaining over the phone what kind of Indian we were, but I didn't understand, nor did my brothers. Questions on my heritage and parents burned within me growing up, and resentment soon took root. I hated them. I hated myself. And I hated explaining to the other kids why my parents weren't around and why my skin was darker than theirs. I used to say that they were dead and that I was Italian or something. If that didn't work, I'd dish out knuckle sandwiches to shut them up. The truth was that it hurt too much to think about those things. The truth was I just didn't know. It was all very damaging to me. By age 15, I was actively denying my heritage and started experimenting with drugs and alcohol to fit in with the cool kids. By 17, I was using hard drugs and going to all night raves. Raves are big overnight dance parties where people use designer drugs like ecstasy, ketamine, crystal meth, and cocaine. I use them all and more. By 19, my grandparents had had enough of my partying and my lies and they kicked me out. To hide my shame, I ran clear across the continent to Vancouver to stay with my brother Josh, who was an RCMP at the time. But he too kicked me out after I smoked weed in his apartment after he specifically told me not to do that. By 21, I was homeless and in Toronto and was introduced to crack cocaine by an acquaintance. The next 11 years of my life were a horrible blur of addiction and homelessness. It went something like this. I'd end up in a shelter somehow and wait the two or three weeks it'd take to get welfare start up for a room or an apartment. Then once the welly check was cut, I'd cash it and move in and use until, and, until the, the rent money was gone. Then I'd jump out the back window at night and, to avoid the landlord leaving all my belongings behind. I'd end up sleeping outside for two, three days or maybe even a week in staircases, on friends' couches, parking garages, storage sheds, on buses, wherever, until I found a shelter bed somewhere. If I was lucky, I might be able to find a couch to surf on for a month or hold a job for a little bit. Many times my brother Jerry gave me a place to stay for a few months and once I lasted nearly 10 months. But he too always kicked me out after he had enough of my shit. By age 30, I was breaking the law to feed my habits and was cycling in and out of the jail system. I can't count how many interactions I've had with the law, but I do know that my conviction record is over four pages long. And my probation officer, my old probation officer, once told me that my total police file is three and a half inches thick, as is my Salvation Army record. Welfare, I assume, is thickest of all, but I don't know. My turning point came in 2005 when in a drunken stupor, I fell off a building and shattered my right heel, my calcaneus, and broke both wrists, my scaphoids. I was rushed to the hospital and had reconstructive surgery on my destroyed right leg. My foot, ankle, and heel re were rebuilt and held together by pins, wires, screws, staples, and a cast. And my broken wrists were left exposed so I could walk in crutches. Needless to say, I had a hard time using those crutches, but somehow I managed. The surgery, however, was a complete failure. The doctors are not to blame, though. I am. I didn't listen to their advice, and I continued using drugs. I was an addict, after all. Nor did I have a stable place to live. The dual combination allowed a severe staph infection to take root in my leg. After a while, my foot became so necrotic that it was in danger of being amputated. Out of desperation and fear, I robbed a 7-Eleven in Brampton, hoping to use the jail system as a safe place to recover. I was close to death. I could feel it. My crime, like my life at this time, was, a pitiful, was pitiful, but I was lucky, I guess. I came before a judge who realized that I wasn't a, cr a criminal by career choice. I was one by circumstance. In fact, he told me I was just about the worst criminal he'd ever seen. <laughs> Hobbled, half-starved, and totally unprofessional. <laughs> In his wisdom, he offered me the chance to change. Rehab or prison, young man, he said. 
those are your options. I chose rehab. It was the first real break I'd gotten in 10 years, and I knew it. I decided then and there that I'd give it my all, get my education, and figure out why I was the way I was. My legs soon healed up with bed rest, antibiotics, and the steady amount of food I received from my jail cellmates. Soon I was walking on my own without crutches or a cane. I also started taking distance high school, reteaching myself how to read and write. And by the time I got to drug rehab, a year later, I was functionally literate. On July 11th, 2008, I put down cigarettes, crack cocaine, and alcohol forever and began my successful run at Harvest House Drug and Alcohol Treatment Center right here in Ottawa. The physical withdrawal lasted for about five days. The psychological dependency, I admit, has never left. I still fight it every day. My schedule at Harvest House was grueling. My day began at 6 a.m. I'd wake up, make my bed with hospital corners, then go down to the dish pit and do mountains of dishes from the night before. Throughout the day, I ran the kitchen, cooked all three meals for the compound, cleaned all the toilets, took addictions modules, participated in group therapy, ran 10 kilometers a day, sold calendars on the phone to pay for my stay, went to church, sang Bible hymns, mopped and waxed the floor, went to personal development classes, and much, much more. Work ended at 10 p.m. every night. It literally went from sun up to sun down, 16 hours a day, every day. In terms of labor, rehab was way harder than jail. <laughs> and the judge who sent me there, he knew it, that old fox, he tricked me. <laughs> the guy who ran Harvest House was an ex-RAF Scotsman named Bill Maine. He kicked all our asses every day and made sure the place was run like a military boot camp from hell. Knees up, chest out, and you followed his orders or else. The military discipline even though I hated it while it was happening, it gave me an unbreakable work ethic that I still use today. Harvest House also taught me the value of good habits. In partnership with Harvest House, I took hygiene and etiquette courses at the University of Ottawa from Dr. Jennifer Lennox Terrian, where I relearned to do basic things like eat at a table with a fork and knife, talk in a respectable fashion, wash my clothes, brush my teeth, and basically keep myself clean and presentable. You see, people lose these skills when they don't use them regularly, regularly, like it happened with me over the years. I remember looking in the mirror, being so proud of my clean clothes, my combed hair when I had some, <laughs> and my brushed teeth. At rehab, the minutes turned to days, the days to weeks, and the weeks to months. Each minute in that place was like an incredible goal reached. I would literally set one or two minute goals. If I could just make it to the next minute, I remember thinking, I might have a chance to live. I might have a chance to be something more than just a struggling crackhead. I remember seeing my first three months of sobriety, thinking that I had achieved the impossible. To me, it was impossible. I still remember the way it looked on the achievements board, Jay Thistle. 90 days. Tears filled my eyes the first time I saw it. I think it was then and there that I was brave enough to dream and have hope again. Based on all the hard work I was putting in, Harvest House offered me the chance to get my education. I started my GED in September and completed it by December 2008. I studied furiously like my life depended on it improving my reading by staying up late every night, poring over encyclopedias in my bed until I fell asleep. I finished at the top of my class. They then enrolled me in a bridging program at Carleton University, where again I finished at the top of my class. My achievements were starting to add up now. I was trying my ass off like I'd never done before in my life. While in rehab, more significant things happened. <laughs> The first was that I doubled in size. <laughs> I entered Harvest House weighing 138 pounds and looked kind of like Gollum from Lord of the, the Rings. You can see him right there. Broken teeth, gray skin, with a permanent sneer on my face. When I left the center, I was a whopping 240 pounds and looked kind of like I do now, <laughs> like middle-aged native guys are supposed to look. 
round, tanned, and sexy. <laughs> the second was that I got my identification again. Birth certificate, health care, health card, social insurance, that sort of thing. I could finally access normal services like health care, school, and employment. I finally had something to show the world that I, too, had a name. See, Jesse Thistle, it says so right there on my shiny new health card. The next thing that happened was that my Métis Cree mother somehow tracked me down. I hadn't spoken to her since I was around 20. I was 33 when she found me at Harvest House. She'd apparently been looking for me the whole time. I'd been homeless. And many times she almost found me. But, she says, I was like a phantom, disappearing into thin air every time she tracked me down in jail or a shelter or on a relative's couch. Today, after many difficult conversations getting to know one another, we talk regularly like, so like son and mother are supposed to, and having her in my life has meant the world to me. It's reconnected me to my kin and my indigenous identity. In a lot of ways, it's made me whole. The fourth thing that happened while I was in rehab was that my grandmother, Jackie, the woman that raised me, contracted leukemia. While she was on her deathbed, I went to go see her to make amends for everything that I'd done over the years. She scolded me at first and called me a dumbass. But then she said she was disappointed in me, not because of the drugs, though, but because she knew how smart I was and that I wasn't using the gifts God had given me. She then pulled me close and made me promise that I'd go to university and take it as far as I could, and to help people instead of hurting them. I remember looking into her milky eyes and promising her that I'd get my education and that I'd be a good person. Two weeks after our last embrace, she was gone. I never did get to see her sober or out of rehab, and it's something that still haunts me to this day. The promise I made to my grandmother that day in the oncology ward has sustained me over the last nine years of sobriety and education. And every time I feel like giving up, or when I get disheartened, or feel that it's too hard, I remember that my grandmother is looking down from heaven, encouraging me to do my best. <clears throat> I also remember that if I don't fly straight, she might reach down and give me a clip to the side of the head, like she used to when she was alive. And that usually gets me going. The fifth and most important thing that happened during my year in rehab was that I met my wife, Lucy, who is my rock, my everything. We started talking the very day my grandmother died on March 15, 2009. My, mother, my grandmother, I believe, sent Lucy to take care of me and to keep me motivated. She, the only woman strong enough to take care of her wayward, troubled grandson. When I graduated from rehab in July 2009, Lucy was there. She picked me up and brought me home to her apartment in Toronto instead of letting me go back into the shelter system right here in Ottawa. It was the first real home I'd had since I first became homeless back when I was a youth. All I had when she picked me up at Harvest House was a garbage bag full of donated clothes, a few bars of soap, a toothbrush, and a dream for a better life. Lucy, for those that don't know, is the real secret behind my success. I want everybody here to know that. She loved and trusted me back when no one else would, when I was just a newly reformed criminal emerging from rehab, one that hadn't been sober in over a decade. I still remember how nice it felt to be loved and trusted by someone after so long. Her love did more to keep me out of jail and off the streets than years of incarceration ever could. In 2012, after working a series of odd jobs, I finally found my way to York University and began honoring the promise I'd made to my dying grandmother. I started taking indigenous history courses and working at the Canadian Observatory on Homelessness to figure out who I was as a Métis Cree person and to see why I was so screwed up all those lost years. I also sought answers as to why I saw so many other indigenous people like me in the jail system, out on the streets, and in the shelters. The combination of these history courses and working in the homeless sector showed me that my mother's people were the rebel fighters who stood up against Canada 
during the Northwest resistance in 1885, only to lose and become dispossessed afterwards. I also saw how my grandmother Jackie's Algonquin line had been traumatized and dysfunctional since my great-grandfather's David's time in Spanish residential school. I saw for the first time that all my lines, even my grandfather Thistle's Gaelic line, had been wronged historically and that their colonial trauma had gone unaddressed and compounded over time and had torn apart my nuclear family by 1979 which in turn forced my parents to let me and my brothers go into adoption in 1980. I saw how the converging lines of transgenerational trauma in both my grandpa and grandma's families had contributed to my dad's alienation, drug issues, and eventual murder in 1982. And I finally saw that I too belonged in the long story of my people, that I too was traumatized by the colonial violence inflicted upon my people and then that was what had stolen my dad in my indigenous identity and unhinged me growing up and influenced me to make poor choices, which led to my homelessness and addictions by the time I was 19. In total, I learned that I and other indigenous peoples in Canada, homeless or not, had inherited and lived with the very real social consequences of the bloody colonial history of this country, the land theft the purposeful destruction of indigenous cultures and languages, the theft of our children to residential schools and children's aid, the ongoing slaughter of our life givers, of our women, the disappearance of our men, of our fathers, the total alienation from our histories, ways of life, and systems of knowledge, the disconnection of our families and kin from each other and from the relationship web of all my relations, and the complete undermining of our worldviews spiritual beliefs, and relationship to creator itself. When I look back at my life, I see all these phenomena at play, impacting me as a young man. I see my, my mother's Métis Cree family lose their lands, homes, and freedom in 1885. I see my indigenous ancestors lose their right to exist on Turtle Island without interference from colonial overlords. I see my Gaelic ancestors torn from their highland homes and made homeless in a foreign land for profit's sake. I see the harmful effects of Indian residential school on my Algonquin culture, language, and heritage, and how it's impacted generations of my relatives. I see the total distortion of my rich and proud rebel Métis Cree history, replaced by tropes of savagery and miscegenation in this country's education system and public history and I see the inability of my indigenous family to cope under the weight of hundreds of years of colonization and trauma brought to bear by the settler state. My work in university, as I've noted, has hum humbly sprung from the promise I made to my dying grandmother and the need to figure myself out, nothing more. It is always centered on love and around mobilizing what I've learned from my homeless experiences to affect positive social change. I have won just about every major award I can win for my level of academe and research. I am the first indigenous person in York's 60 year history to win a Governor General Medal, the top graduating student out of 50,000. I'm the first student in York's history, indigenous or not, to win both the Trudeau and Vanier doctoral scholarships simultaneously. And from what I've, to I've been told, I'm the first student, indigenous or not, in Canadian history to win both the Trudeau and Vanier doctoral scholarship while still in their masters. And in 2016, I placed as one of the highest rank incoming PhDs in the country. My rise out of homelessness to become one of the top students in the country is significant in its own right. And so is the knowledge that I gained along the way. But I did not come here to talk about myself exclusively. I came instead to offer insight into indigenous homelessness and to present these understandings here in the form of a new national definition of indigenous homelessness that I worked on at the COH between January 2016 and August 2017. 
The definition you see here, this comes in part from my experiences as I've shared with you all today. But I am only one Indigenous person and I do not fully grasp the total homeless experience of all Indigenous peoples on Turtle Island. To capture a more complete understanding of Indigenous homelessness, one that encompasses First Nations, Métis, and uh, Inuit homelessness, I turned to over 50 Indigenous scholars and communities across the country over an 18-month period of consultation. These are the names of the people whose knowledge has been mobilized to create this definition. From the beginning, we asked them what they believed Indigenous homelessness to be, and they told us. Our approach may seem simple, but for academia, it was radical and represented a grassroots approach to definition writing instead of the old top-down way of doing things. Our approach followed three uh, comprehensive levels of consultation, the National Steering Committee, uh, the regional councillors and the National Elders Committee. Each provided key insights into capturing the 12 dimensions of Indigenous homelessness that you see before you. In simplest terms, the definition captures Indigenous homelessness not as being without a brick and mortar home, but as a disconnection from the relationship web of all my relations due to processes of colonization. I use my life story as a way to show how that disconnection affects real people like me and how reconnecting people back into the web of all my relations can help solve Indigenous homelessness on the ground. All my relations, for those that don't know, is an Anishinaabek worldview. Virtually all the Indigenous people we consulted had a similar worldview that imagines that all things, living and inanimate, are interconnected to one another. We are connected to the land, to the animals, to spirits, to ancestors, to our histories, to our stories, to our teachings, to each other, to ourselves, and to Creator. This is the circle of life, the interconnected circle of being, and Indigenous homelessness, as defined by the definition, articulates the harmful disconnection Indigenous peoples have endured over the years, the end result being First Nations, Inuit, and Métis homelessness as we see it in our streets today. In knowing of this disconnection, I am certain we can plan a better way to bring our homeless relatives back into the circle, like Harvest House, Lucy, my mom, forgiving my father, the promise to my dying grandmother, and understanding my, understanding my own indigenous history and identity as a Métis Cree person did for me. In knowing of this, I am certain in the next 150 years that we can make a difference. I am certain we can bring our kin back to the warmth of the fire. I am certain, in the words of Althea Gabas, the Bannock Lady of Winnipeg, we can rebuild the village that we once had. Thank you.